for, for plebs, by plebs, dropping the Bitcoin only signal. Pleb underground. Welcome everyone to the Pleb Underground. Welcome back to Pleb Underground. This is episode 64. Trying to evolve while I walk with my sobriety. Life might test my resolve, but no shortcuts to piety. I might have stopped smoking, but I'm still spitting fire. Always thought provoking. Being a man is to inspire. Gotta make money. 1% inspiration. Proof of work. 99% perspiration. Hot and humid, but not making it rain. Fly her into my tower. She's far from plain. Call 911, but that's not her number. Destroy her late, then enjoy the slumber. Clear as day, I see you. Enemies belong in the ICU. Covered in gems, ICU, iodine and copper, that's ICU. Authoritarian states grifting emergency powers. Egalitarian greats gifting emergency flowers. Decorating their families' empty graves. War paid for by civilian tax slaves. Obsessed with charts, but you got no hits. TA's a fool's game, don't listen to Finn twits. Not upside down, not scared of the work us. Can't fight with the clown, not part of the circus. My wife's funny, she's a jester. Call me like Lemon Drizzle, cause I zest her. We're young, she's impressed, I'm always learning. For her tongue to be depressed, she's always yearning. Stored keys, aged like cheese, not wine. Health checks regularly, if you wanna sign. Not fiat lives, not about excess. Hot girl size, mine's an excess. Others get out, permanent host states, while I'm about, permanent flow states. Right line, tight, she's mine, invite, 69, almighty sign. Don't give a fuck about equity, I'm not the stonk king. Gotta transcend luck, inequity, I am the strong king. They used to pillage and rape, now it's the pill age, mouths gape. Filling up with medications instead of fasting, meditations. I like to travel, fly a plane, to the judge with the gavel on a higher plane. Work for yourself, that's agency. Listen to your elders, what do the aging see? Cover your cameras, no agency. You off on a trip, the Aegean Sea. Lifting daily, a source of high tea, giving hail to the mighty, setting sail on the high sea. You're stuck, calling IT. Have you tried turning it on, off again? Have you tried learning with one buff friend? You're waiting for the family nest egg to get laid. You discard all the beef because you want to get paid. I'm in the gym hitting PBs, your jelly. Eating whole foods, not PB and jelly. You picked a Bitcoin killer. You've been fooled. There's no slay coin. We're back with a privacy biller. He's called Dan Gould to talk pay join. Congrats on that, Walton, by the way. Congrats on that. And guys, in case you didn't understand from that absolutely awesome rap, we've got leading development on PayJoin, DevKit, and adoption, and he's connected to the grassroots growth of Bitcoin and co-host of BitDevs in multiple cities. It's Dan Gould that is joining us on the Pleb Underground. Dan, we are absolutely humbled to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. I am stoked to be here in the tunnels, guys. Thanks for having me. Sweet. All right. We are going to move it on over to the numbers. Yeah, the numbers, of course, brought to us by Time Chain Stats, Time Chain Calendar, and now sponsored by BTC Pins. The numbers are brought to you by BTC Pins. Check them out at btcpins.com. Guys, check it out. It's absolutely awesome. High quality pins. Use the code PLEB Underground for 5% off at btcpins.com. Pins made by a fellow Bitcoiner for us, the Bitcoiners. At the time of this recording, the block height is 817,209. The Bitcoin fiat exchange is 36,446. Moscow time, 2743. Total public lightning capacity, 5,342. Dot nine, the fastest fee, 87 sats per V-byte. Oh my gosh, days to the happening, 158. And guys, our chain rewrite days, 701. The numbers. I'm being told, I'm being told, before we actually take a look at any of our numbers articles, I'm being told that uh, the ET, that, that the ET, one of the ETF decisions is supposed to be happening this afternoon. We're recording this on Friday at uh, November, November 17th. So just for reference for the viewers. So supposedly in the next couple of hours, we may see some, uh, we may see some fiat Bitcoin exchange volatility, possibly. One, oh. fuck ETFs. That's right. Um, <laughs> not your That's keys, it. not your coins. Um, two, fucking shit coiners. Um, <laughs> like why, what, what, why do you want to, uh, yeah, why? Just why? Why are you spamming the mempool? Like, 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 like it, I mean, at the same time, we have this, we have this conflict, right? When if 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 
someone did a meme. I can't think who did it. But the 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 mempool fees, right? When it's green, fees are too low. And when it's like red, fees are too high, right? There's clearly neither are true, right? Fee, fees are what fees are. But why? Why are these people minting BRC20 tokens in giant, giant numbers? Is is this an attack on Bitcoin? Or is it or is it just people spending Bitcoin in a really silly way? What do you think, Dan? Do I think people are selling Bitcoin in silly ways? No, I think people are minting insanity constantly. Is that, is that spending in a silly way? I, let them do it. I don't know. I can't control them. Let them do it. Uh, see, this is the thing, right? Like that That's exactly the point. It, it's like... Because Bitcoin is what it is and it, you know, we have the ethos that we have to a certain extent, it's like, yeah, I, you know, I can't stop you from doing that, nor do I necessarily want to stop you from doing that because that's censorship and that's going against the whole point. But at the same time, I also want to be able to, to call it out and, and crap on it if I don't, if I don't agree with it, you know? So yeah. It, I it's see like, a bit like, it's, hmm? go well, ahead. I, was thinking, I see a bit like traffic in, on the roads, right? There's a whole bunch of, I don't know. Whole bunch of people just trying to get places, right? Like, uh, who? You have to. You can yell at it, and sometimes, sometimes I really yell at people. Like, I'm like, I just there's just retards everywhere. There's just there's just people there. Like, some of it I blame fear, right? Maybe maybe they're just you know everyone's consuming a bunch of sludge and they they work too much and everyone's on the roads because everyone has to work, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But but what can you do you can't you have to kind of plan around it right and i think this is the bigger picture that actually when we have low fee environments bitcoiners need to need to be need to be thinking a little bit more about you know consolidation i'm sure dan has some maybe opinions on this with regards to privacy but but if you know if you've got a bunch of small utxos and and then you have a high fee environment you can, you're going to you're going to really struggle um, and also things like opening and closing lightning channels we talked a few weeks back the the lightning channel operators i think are the the buyers of of last resort that they will always be you know they've they're always ready to kind of you know pay one or two sats per v byte um to to be opening and closing their channels but i think i think all bitcoiners need to be need to be planning a little bit more and and taking advantage of low fee environments because when you have environments like this and you want to make a transaction it's 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 you know you're going to pay a very high percentage fees for a small transaction so you must you know I, i'm a i'm a big lightning fan i think you should be i think you should be running your own lightning and i think you should be opening the channels when we have these these low fee environments so that then when you have these high fee environments you still have the capacity to to spend uh, and and receive bitcoin without a big percentage cut um you know as you would have for an on-chain payment I think the taproot people, <laughs> it's crazy that the taproot people are the inscribers right now. Like we need to get economic activity actually in taproot, but they seem to be the buyers of last resort more and more. Like everyone is willing to inscribe a JPEG of a picture of their dog for one sat per byte. So I don't know when that competition plays out with the lightning settlement. It's very interesting. As as a wise man once said, find find a partner that looks at you like Eric looks at Udi's crotch. You like that? <laughs> Wasn't that your meme today? That I think. was my meme. That that actually was. I I I got a banger. <laughs> I was like, yeah, look at that. That worked. Oh gosh. But but it's true. You could see it. It's true love. And they just got seven point five million dollars to produce absolute garbage in in my opinion right can't stop them can't stop them from doing it but can make fun of it i think they um, are actually bringing interest to bitcoin too they like are, it no, is this tangential absolutely. weird thing but a lot of people are scratching their head and go oh bitcoin again like i saw an article earlier this week about you know one of these taproot wizards guys he's like oh look at bitcoin they have bitvm and they have all this cool stuff that's happening which i think the understanding there might not be accurate like bitvm is a toy and i don't think that's how we're going to advance but these people are looking at it and they're like oh maybe we maybe the future is here which obviously it is yeah. right yeah I think I... there's a lot of a lot of hype things attract different groups and there's a whole bunch of people that actually really like collectibles and don't actually give a fuck about money like i i, I met a bunch of people at some some bitcoin art event in london last month 
and they 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 don't really care about about the money they care about like weird fucking art to be honest they, they, some of them want to have physical pieces some of them want to have yeah want to have digital they want their they're digital collectors and I, I to me it's wild but i think th there will always be different groups of people w wanting to do different things um and you can't really stop them right if you want some if you want to use a permissionless technology you can't really complain about someone else using it in a permission permissionless way either at the same time i still call them fucking shit coiners and you know get annoyed when the mempools clog but you know what do, you, what do i do i have to go around it right well they are yeah they are gambling a thing i hear more and more is as maybe the interest rate is higher money is more difficult to come by there are more people with fewer means they want to take these chances they want to go and gamble their money because that's hope for them so that is a huge way to get people into this system, whether you have moral difficulty with it or not, or whether it's just a pain in the ass. As the money gets worse, people are more and more encouraged to gamble for for alpha. That that that's essentially what it is. But I just want to go back to the point that Walton made about the collectors, because I am, as you know, as people know, like I love collect toys and crap like that, and um, I. I I have no problem with people collecting digital art or real art or whatever it is. Anybody can collect really anything that, that they want that makes them happy. Um, what the problem is, right? What the problem is, is the sellers of these things. This is what we've said, you know, many times before. They, um, the way that these products are marketed, that's the problem, right? Like people are not being, people are not being genuine about what it is. Like if somebody sat there and told you like, look, you know, this is just, you know, this digital artifact and, you know, essentially presenting it in a way for a collector to buy it just because they're intrigued by the, you know, the actual piece itself is one thing, but pitching it to them, like it's going to be a way as a savings vehicle into the future. That's where we start to get into the gray area. And unfortunately that's what you get with a lot of the, you know, the shit coining in, in the majority, you know, in the majority of cases it's, you know, they, they're trying to tell you that it's like Bitcoin. It has Bitcoin like qualities, but it is nothing like Bitcoin, even if in this case, it's built partially on Bitcoin because the inscription actually is in Bitcoin. It's the other piece when we're talking about ordinals and stuff like that, that is outside the system. So that's just the, that's just garbage. Think, to, to me, the Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. I don't think, I don't think anything really has intrinsic value. Um, value is what is, is subjective and it's what someone else will pay for it. And, and these, and what's, what, what subjectively has value to one group of people has a very different value to different people. I think, I think, I personally think the vast, yeah, vast majority of NFTs are, are worthless. I don't know if, I don't know if some of the older, you know, original Pepe's may have some value. I, I, as far as I'm aware, there's, you know, I, I know some people that are hardcore Bitcoiners that have some old Pepe's that will hold them for a very long time. But yeah. I don't know if it's more about owning a piece of history than actually trying to um, flip it long term, that they're exactly. actually thinking more like it's it's that it has a huge amount of sentimental value for them, and and it's that they're it can't be owned by a whole bunch of people, and so it's they're, they're in this. I guess it's a bit like any sort of collectors, right? The people who collect I don't know Egyptian artifacts or whatever it is that there are you know these things, and they're a piece of history, and for whatever reason that person wants to own that that piece of history. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna take a look at our first uh, our first article here for the numbers. <laughs> Let's take a look. We got some links from Walton. Walton, thank you very much for providing us the numbers links, and we've got the Kobe Essie letter. Let's dive into this. Maybe maybe Dan Gould can also. I don't know if uh, I don't know how much you pay attention to the the macro, right? The uh, the macro that's going on, but uh, it looks like things are falling apart. Let's dive into it. Annualized interest expense on U.S. debt is now at one point oh seven uh, one. 0.027 trillion and is quickly rising. Just two years ago, annual interest expense on U.S. debt was at 450 billion. That's a 128 percent jump in interest expense, and we didn't even enter a recession yet. Since 2020, total U.S. debt is up approximately 10 trillion dollars and set to hit 35 trillion in 2024. That's approximately 45 percent jump in U.S. debt, and the Fed is still calling for a soft landing. Something is not adding up here. Walton, I uh, I couldn't agree with this more. Something is not adding up here. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it. The 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 jump in, the jump in the amount of tax revenue that is being paid on interest on debt in most countries is increasing. Um, I don't really see how that changed, right? This this debt spiral, but there's gonna there's there's been gradually, and now there's suddenly, right? Because as as um, you know, sovereign debt gets re reissued, it gets sold at a at a higher interest rate, and so then the the interest payments can really can really jump, especially when you're increasing the total amount of um you know the the total debt burden so the question is this right now I was actually talking about this yesterday in a space um when do we hit that escape velocity i mean this is this is almost the freaking hockey stick this is pretty much a hockey stick like i i feel you know i mean when we read books like um when money dies um escape it, it's like Escape velocity happens, it seems, from one minute to the next. And somehow, we're not there yet. And I think the reason why we're not there yet, of course, is because the U.S. is still currently the the, the, the global uh, reserve currency. Um, and as a result, as a result, we're able to sustain this charade, I, I think, a little bit longer. Anyways, Dan, what are your, uh, I don't know, do you dig into the macro? <laughs> what are your thoughts? I follow it. I don't, I don't want to be a doomer though. So it's a difficult <laughs> okay. thing to Go ahead, be a doomer. You know, talk about it or add something of value. It's a huge reason why I got into Bitcoin, why I stay into Bitcoin. Cause I think it makes sense as a money, of course, but I don't know how much value I have to add. You know, if you have your Bitcoin, I think it's a hedge against this insanity. It's, I think it's the only thing. And we're going to see, I've always been interested in the sovereigns more than anything, whether that's individuals or whether that's states republics that are going and taking this money and holding it in their treasuries i think it's inevitable it's the only out my understanding is that um there's this the, uh, facility called the reverse repo where you have basically a bunch of banks park parking money um yeah. and that's that's been falling so they're choosing they're choosing not to do that um and i my understanding is essentially um you're going to have less and less commercial banks buying US treasuries and increasingly it'll be the Fed doing so. Um, I think internationally, I think there's going to be fewer buyers of treasuries. I think there's a lot of a lot of geopolitics that, that's going on that's going to heavily influence this kind of stuff. I think the US has a lot of imperial hubris um, in the same way the Brits did 100 years ago. Um who knows what's going to happen? I think anyone, again, anyone that tells you they know the timelines for any of this stuff, they're wrong, right? The 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 doomsayers, they're often right about what's going to happen, but but they're often very wrong about the timelines. Like I'm a few years ago, oh, even two years ago, we were talking, and everyone was convinced interest rates will never go to four percent. Everything will collapse if that happens, and I believe they're higher than that now. So it's it's. <laughs> Right, it's, it's the, the timelines. No one really knows, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of political political plays. Um, there's a lot of regulation that can happen that can then cause, I don't know, commercial banks to actually have to buy treasuries, even though they don't want to. And there's, there's lots of kind of weird ropes that can get pulled by the state. Who knows what can happen? Yeah, absolutely. And if people want to get a, an idea of essentially how this all falls apart for a specific country, you can definitely, I, I suggest reading When Money Dies. That That is that that is a really eye-opening read. And guys, um, this wraps up the numbers. And don't forget, don't forget, not your keys, not your coin. It's all about being self-sovereign, okay? Take personal responsibility of your Bitcoin. Check the show notes for the Not Your Keys, Not Your Coin links. We've got a bunch of links to help get you started and staying sovereign. We are moving on over to the Fireside Chat. The Fireside Chat is brought to you by CypherSafe. Check them out at cyphersafe.io. Your seed is the most important thing. And as we saw this week, 
see what happens when people get hacked. You can't trust. You have to verify. Store your seed in the Cypher Grid. This thing is virtually indestructible. It also comes with this great little punch tool, and that's at cyphersafe.io. If you appreciate fine, high-quality Bitcoin art, check out the Bitcoin Rollo Triangle. 16 ounces of solid titanium made by a Bitcoiner for fellow Bitcoiners. Check it out at cyphersafe.io. That is the Bitcoin Rollo Triangle. Welcome back, everyone. We are sitting down. Well, we're, we're always sitting down. I know we're terrible about the chair maximalism. You can blame me. You could see my chair. I know. Anyways, we are sitting down with Dan Gould, and Dan Gould does a lot of really amazing stuff in the Bitcoin space, as we mentioned in the beginning, leading development on pay join, dev kit, and adoption, and of course, the growth of Bitcoin and the co-host of BitDevs in multiple cities across, is it just the US or anywhere else? I co-host Boston right now, but I've had okay. a ton of fun in other cities. We did the one uh, in Malaysia and I helped start the one in Taipei, in Taiwan. Cool, all right, awesome. So look, thank you very much again, like we said, thank you very much for joining us on the show. And before, I, I'm, I'm sure Walton has a bunch of questions for you, but I, I personally, I'd like to know uh, a little bit more about, you know, how you got into, you know, how you got into Bitcoin and why it is that you're doing what you're doing. I, there's very few people that I've spoken to that work in the privacy aspect. So I am definitely curious. Phil loves the orange pill story because everyone's yeah. orange pill story is different. It's the best. Yeah. I just listened to Edward Snowden streak, uh, speak at the Tokyo Noster event, Nostrasia. And that brought me back to 2013 when all that came out. And that really impacted me. I was in high school at the time and I knew I wanted to work in technology, but I wasn't sure exactly what. And I saw the surveillance state growing and people around just not paying attention. So when I heard about Bitcoin shortly after, it just made so much sense as a way to solve the problem with natural incentives that people have. Like people aren't going to necessarily opt into using all sorts of privacy tech until it's too late. And Bitcoin gives you an opportunity to use money without asking the permission of someone else. So I was super fortunate that when I was studying Bitcoin and trying to figure out open source software, how to get these two things aligned, how to contribute. I found Ethan Heilman's Tumblebit paper because I was interested in the privacy aspect more than anything. For Bitcoin to su succeed for me, it has to be as good as cash on the internet. And yes, scaling is an issue, getting a lot of people to use it, but I think being able to use it and have that confidence that it is cash private is really what's going to get a lot of these sovereigns that I was talking about before over the line. So I found this paper on Reddit. My head exploded. I'm like, oh, you can actually have some guarantees about privacy on Bitcoin. And when I found out Ethan wrote it, my mind was blown even more because he was a teaching assistant for my probability and statistics class that I was in. So I got to just walk up to him and say, what is this? What are you doing? And he invited me to work in the research lab at school. And ever since then, it's been trying to figure out how Bitcoin can get these privacy preserving properties. So lots of that, which was an English company, actually, this company Strat uh, Stratus, they were working on that for a while, but they started shit coining a little bit too much. They were trying to get pro footballers to what do you mean a little coin. bit too much like it surely any shit coin is a little bit too much <laughs> well no, the promise when i was working for them adoption. at first when i was working with them at first everything we were doing was bitcoin like the tumble bit was on bitcoin and they wanted their stratus master node thing to run the coordinator but they just stopped even working on that and they, this was before fincen came out with guidance so they were scared that they were going to be money launderers so they weren't even work willing to take a risk because oh we can just sell i think they're on like their third token now they've just iterated <laughs> every time they're like oh we're gonna have a new token for the same thing uh but around that time i met or at least i was became familiar with nicholas doria of btc pay and adam fixer from wasabi because they were they were doing that too you know they were working on the same project they were working on tumblebit 
So I followed Wasabi development and CoinJoin and the Lightning Network. And I think a lot of the privacy focus has just gone straight to Lightning without paying attention to the base layer problems that don't get solved by using a second layer. Like you always have to settle to the base layer. So we talked about this last week, actually, that the, mm-hmm. the, uh, we Sorry. had Andre from Zebedee on, um, and I, I raised this, this, there's a, tr- you can't, you have to essentially publish, um, the, the UTXO that is for a lightning channel, because otherwise the lightning channel could, the, the light, the whole lightning network could be spoofed, right? You could have a whole bunch of channels that, uh, that aren't linked to real Bitcoin. Um, and so there's a, there's some sort of trade off right of of how do you how can you have privacy but have public lightning channels um like where should privacy be should it be on do we need it on the base layer should it be on lightning or you know there's there's a few people building what like e-cash layer three kind of things where they where there's privacy why can you tell us more why why privacy needs to be on the base layer because my understanding again is there's trade-offs there again because if you want to have we can't obfuscate What's the, the base word. layer. The the and I mentioned a shitcoin, right? Like people people say, oh, Monero has great privacy. But my understanding is that there's this there's this dilemma. If 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 you if you want to have like crazy privacy, then then actually it becomes difficult to verify total supply. For example, that's that's my understanding of Monero. Is you can't you can't verify total supply, and that's the trade off they're making in order to have the privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, how how are we able to yeah re- retain the kind of um the true supply and have privacy and why why do you think the the work needs to be done on on the base layer rather than on other layers? So we're getting all of this. This there's two problems. There's the verification problem, and then there's also the like can people use it problem. Uh, the verification problem i think we're going to have zero knowledge proofs that don't use assumptions beyond the ones bitcoin already makes i'm not sure but that seems like it could be possible in some future to me so if we had that then you could have a system that was all based on zero knowledge proofs and you wouldn't worry about the supply so much but i don't think we're going to be able to fork that into bitcoin like bitcoin's already been going strong 99.9 percent of time for a decade plus so CoinJoin was really fascinating to me when I found out about it because you get the privacy from the multiple ways you can interpret a transaction, which every transaction has multiple ways you can interpret it. It has some ambiguity. A lot of people will talk about anonymity set, but I think this is not quite the right way to think about it because you're talking about value. So every person has a different amount of value they're transacting. It's kind of difficult to put a plain anonymity set on this. It's like... Uh, mm-hmm. Every magnitude has a different anonymity set. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. I think we can get privacy on the base layer by doing batching, which we need anyway to save in fees. Batching is the simplest way to scale any database. Any database engineer will tell you that. Collaborative spends, that kind of concept. Yeah, and we need it to happen when people are making a transaction, when they're ready to put a transaction intent out into the world, that's when it needs to be batched. So that's why I started focusing in earnest on pay join. And what, so my understanding right now is there's a few different uh, projects focused on, on privacy, right? Um, and, and many of them have very different philosophical stances um, and, and ways that they've, they've done things, right? Um Samurai, um, a, a very kind of anti-state, right? They believe that privacy is a, is a human right, um, and they and they basically refuse to negotiate with terrorists uh, or, or state actors, kind of thing, right? They have they have a, a kind of hardline thing. Um, wasabi, um, seemingly kind of cut to the state, right? And 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 are kind of working with some chain analysis firms. Um, those are the kind of two biggest centralized um coordinators of 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 i'm I'm probably misusing the wrong terms here of like privacy solutions um you then have join market which isn't very user friendly 
is my understanding because you've got to do it all basically in in command line um and 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 we've got pay join like what 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 makes pay join different from some of these other ones that that the other people may have heard of so instead of answering what makes pay join different first let's go back to the incentives of these companies like we have samurai and wasabi who have huge adoption because they have money and they have the ability to market because they're companies but the problem when you're a for-profit company is you have a an obligation to your shareholders to chase that next dollar not to give people better privacy or better software from their perspective you are legally obligated to that you can say they're anti-state but the reality is these people have corporate duties like they're well intertwined with the state and join market has the opposite problem like the software is the software is what the software is open the software is free if you use it correctly correctly which is like a problem in itself then you can have some good privacy guarantees but it's not as friendly they don't have the resources to really dig into the is join market like the linux essentially compared to say i don't know windows or or, or apple and they, those guys are a bit, maybe a bit more like the other guys or is the, that really bad i would apparently? compare it most to like whatsapp versus signal signal just put out some document some blog post earlier this week maybe today that was asking for money and they're saying because we're a non-profit foundation we can pursue privacy, you know, even when your profile picture on Signal isn't just plainly stored on their server, like you send it to someone over an encrypted channel. So they only have the last time you logged in and your phone number. But, but WhatsApp doesn't do that. To do that because they're selling a shit coin on the side, right? Moxie, Moxie made something called mobile coin. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, I think they're trying to do that, but I don't think that's very successful. I don't think that's actually a real source of income for them. I think it's because of the culture the blood of the organism that is the signal foundation is just very different from a for-profit company and the for-profit companies that work on bitcoin privacy have done a great job of moving that ball forward but i just don't think they have the incentives to take that long-term thinking and be very slow and deliberate about providing a comprehensive solution the issue you were talking about earlier with okay, we have privacy on layer three eCache or Lightning, but not the base layer. When you leak just a little bit of metadata at any one of those layers, if someone can collect that, they can uh, create intersections between your metadata here and your metadata there. And the privacy above that doesn't even matter. They can get around that. Yeah. So we really need it to be airtight at each layer along the way, uh, which is why we build in layers too, because we can simplify it and focus on privacy within a small model. and build up from there. So the whole point of pay join, which is what I've been getting to, like, what is it is when you make that transaction, you coordinate with your peer. It's simplified right now. It's because it has no financial incentive, like a coordinator does a coin join coordinator. It's taken longer to rally people. A bunch of people who have worked on pay join have kind of abandoned it just because there's no financial incentive for them to continue pushing on that problem. But now I think that's changing the branding of pay join dev kit, the support of people like OpenSats and Bob spaces and HRF who uh, gave the pay join project a gift like years ago have made it possible for us to create this drop in client solution that works in the typical flow you're already used to. You scan the QR code. It just happens in the background. Like, you know, you're, wallet is going to talk to the internet and talk to your peer and you don't need to enter any details you don't need to be super proactive about it if you're an enterprise you're probably going to take more steps and you're going to be able to afford to do that especially if you can save money from fees but because PayJoin combines this user experience of happening at the time of payment and the financial incentive of the sender and receiver both being able to contribute and do a consolidation at the same time i think it has a real chance to solve the problem like completely at the base layer maybe not in this form maybe some future iteration of it but i think the form factor the fact that it happens automatically when you make the payment or just when you transfer even when you take funds out of cold storage it gives you that opportunity not to leak metadata at this layer so all the other layers can actually maintain that protection and you can have this cash like privacy throughout the whole stack 
I really did not know that much about about pay join, so I, I genuinely appreciate you explaining this to me. I, I can tell you when we're done the show, I'm definitely going to check it out. <laughs> as oh. as a developer of um, a service like this, do you and and as a as a, a, a developer of this that isn't anonymous, right? You're you're Dan Gould, um, being Dan Gould, producing some software um, that people can use to. Um, to to have better privacy, do you, are, you, are you concerned about your own um, individual legal risk? Uh, the reason I ask this question is because, of course, there was the um, um, Ethereum Tornado Cash developer was arrested and held, you know, um, I believe in Amsterdam, was it, um, for, for an extended period of time because people are using his software to, to do illegal things. At the same time, um, Waxwing, guy who's based in the UK, who I understand um, has has worked on CoinJoin, he he has you know concerns about these sorts of things as well. Um, like how how do you and and the, and the samurai guys are anonymous, right? And like how how do you balance legal risks when trying to help help individuals achieve privacy which i think should be should be a human right like how 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 do you do this a focus on privacy is the right thing to do and unless someone comes out and puts their neck on the line other people aren't going to share that belief other people aren't going to think That's it's right. the right thing to do they're going to say why is this guy wearing a hood all the time why is he if he actually believes this is the right thing to do why can't he put his reputation behind it and i think that has stifled some of the uptick of these technologies the only way this works at the base layer is if loads and loads of people are using it and the people that use bitcoin to move the most money are well-regulated enterprises so they have to use this too and they're not going to interface with a company that doesn't have a face they're not even going to interface with an open source peer-to-peer -peer tech that doesn't have a face and doesn't have someone going after it so i definitely do worry significant significantly but i think it's i think it's the right thing to do and i think it's the only way we actually get this over the line the other difference with tornado cash is that they have a DAO, so now you're dabbling in the securities regulators purview governance uh, tokens yeah there's just a there's some concerns <laughs> with that pay join as it is today is totally peer-to-peer -to -peer, so there's no third party involved the version two that's slowly being rolled out uses a third party server that's like a mailbox i think that kind of technology is well established not to be money transmission, not to be in anyone's view like that. Now that could change, but I think I think someone with a face, someone that can be trusted, has to go forward and argue for it. Yeah, I, and I, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, and I just wanted to add to that that essentially, you know, the corporate owned media plays a massive role in mm. and has played a massive role in demonizing personal privacy, right? So it, it seems to be okay if specific entities maintain their privacy, but you on a personal level, if you are an advocate of that privacy and you want to maintain your own privacy, there's kind of this underlying, and again, this is the corporate owned media and just the average everyday person. There's this underlying idea that you have something to hide, right? And and that's just not necessarily true. And because of this, I mean, this has been going on for years. I mean, I remember even as a kid, right? Like they were already telling you this messaging, you know, like, what do you have to hide? You know, it's like, no, it's and not meanwhile, about the billionaires are using shell companies from like, you know, island right. states and all this, all these kind of things. Right. Mo what what do they say? Like money laundering is only illegal if you're if you're poor or something like this. It's like, yeah, it's it's one rule, one rule, so for privacy. one and, and one rule for others. Right. And, and meanwhile, Klaus Schwab says we're going to have a you know really transparent world where everything is transparent and you have nothing to worry about as long as you're not doing anything wrong. Right. <laughs> 
But that's subjective, and that changes over time, and that's increasingly politicized, right? I saw some, like... Even if even if you're in the same place as a protest, maybe your you know emergency powers are extended to the police, and you know there's all sorts of all sorts of changes that happen, and all sorts of things that are increasingly criminalised or not even criminalised, right? They're just they're just questioned, or they're or they're. Well, the issue with these most recent rules is that they're all done. It's legislation by executive action it's not going through any sort of representative process and coin center just highlighted this week the reasons they think the bank secrecy act is unconstitutional which is amazing because what happens is the the president and his administration comes in and says oh this whole class of transactions this whole if you're using crypto if you're using bitcoin if you're using DAOs, like whatever they want if you're depositing more than ten thousand dollars in a bank you must be a criminal. We're going to put you under this scrutiny and assume that you're guilty before any sort of legal process happens. It's good to see that there's a growing movement pushing back on that. And the other fortunate thing is that I'm in the US, at least, where we assume we have some First Amendment protections, Fourth Amendment protections mm. that doesn't necessarily play out instantly. Like the legal process is slow and grueling, but yeah. We have that ideal, that cultural ideal to stand up for. And I think that has, at least till now, mostly held true. Yeah. Even if, you know, we have the Patriot Act, we have the Bank Secrecy Act, it can go over a 50 year period of it being garbage and happening. There's routes to push against that. And there's cultural currents that won't let it exist forever. Dan, just final question. Where where can people um, find you on, on uh, is it Twitter? And where can they learn more about PayJoin? If you go to my website, bitgold.com, bitgold.com, you'll find my Twitter, my Noster keys, my GitHub. That's a good way to follow me. To learn about PayJoin, go to payjoin.org if you want to learn about the high level, what it is, why your wallet should use it and implement it and send them an email, send them a tweet, say, Hey, pay attention to this pay join thing. I want this. If you're a developer or involved in a project that can use pay join, check out payjoindevkit.org. That's where the software dev kit that lets you use pay join lives. And yeah, just stay tuned, share it with your friends. Very cool. And we are actually going to put that in the show notes so people can go and check it out great work that that you're doing and we really appreciate it and guys this wraps up the fireside chat we are moving on over to wrecked up next is wrecked sponsored by represent represent are a bitcoin owned brand that can't get you wrecked they're not a custodian they're not going to hold your Bitcoin. They just make some cool shit like these T-shirts, which you can't buy. But if you want to buy something nearly as cool, you can head over to representltd.com and use the pleb, the code, sorry, the code pleb underground to get a discount on all of their goodies. Once again, that's representltd.com. The first, the first, first story on Wreck this week. Um, I'm bringing to you um, actually a tweet from. I think one of the one one of them I don't know one of the slimiest characters in the Bitcoin space one of these one of these uh you know limp looking guys wearing wizard hats um um but he 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 raised I thought quite a quite a funny story I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share it with you um let me share my screen so uh I say guy sorry er er lady er Erica Erica Wall or whatever you call him um um. He said, if, if you want to understand how retarded the Federal Reserve really is, they brought in an ex-Federal Reserve guy to be a critic in the Richard Hart documentary. And after learning about it, he became a hexagon and teaches hex to his students in classrooms now. Now, one of the comments said, this can't possibly be true. Please post the source. Um, this guy, yes. Lamont Blank, um, former Federal Reserve employee um, and now hexagon, um, 
says that central banks control the fiat money supply in traditional macroeconomics. In hexonomics, stakers control the hex money supply. This represents a paradigm shift from a centralized money supply to a decentralized money supply. Um, and uh, he's actually got uh, his students doing like projects on this at some university. Like, is there no is there no link? Like, is there no is there no bound to which people can be scammed? Like, can, can any can anyone be scammed by these shit coiners? Okay, so so look, um, I'm just gonna say this before we before we let Dan go off on this. Um, but Richard Hart, love him or hate him, is a fantastic social engineer. Okay, and if the wrong person in the wrong state of mind listens to him. <laughs> OK, like they're going to get grifted because I, I have look, I, I have spent many hours watching a lot of his streams way back in the day. OK, and the way that he words things, he can convince you that he is teaching you things, OK, even though he's taught you nothing. So this is really he's he to me, that's very dangerous. Anyway, he's a con. The reason they're called con yeah. artists yeah. is not because it's not because it's a trick. It's yeah. confidence, right? They 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 exude confidence, yes. right? They they get you to believe in in what they're saying because because of how they present it, right? And because shit coins don't have true utility. They don't have. Um, the product isn't that good. It needs to be all marketing. And so you get characters like, like Richard that are really good at marketing because that's all they've got. But it fools people, right? There is no bound. There is no bound. Sitting at lunch after Bitcoin Miami, some people came up to me and were saying how much the conference was only Bitcoin and have I heard about Hex? They were wearing the shirts. They were wearing the whole garb. They're everywhere. Yeah, they're convinced. They're confident, for sure. I think one of the I think one of the biggest problems is is that and again, right? It's it's kind of like the it's kind of like the XRP army. Like you could tell a lot of these people have never actually done the math, right? Like once upon a time they were like XRP the standard. It's going to five hundred eighty nine dollars. It's like, did you do the math? You, you sure about that? That's that's not going to work out too well. But with the hex army, they're like a bit of a special type of special, okay? Because Richard. Richard created this out of absolutely nothing. And then just essentially what you do is you go to this hex website, right? And you just, you're, you're looking at numbers on a screen. Like there is nothing in the background. There is no ecosystem. There's absolutely, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's just a shell. So you go there, you deposit your whatever hex, you know, into your contract. And oh, there goes my camera. Anyways, you deposit your hex into your contract and then all of a sudden, right, the number, the number starts to go up. That's all created out of thin air. All of it's created out of thin air. And to my knowledge, I don't remember what the exact numbers are, but but Richard, you know, Richard holds holds the keys to the origination contract, number one, and number two holds the majority of hex. So I don't see why anybody is is pretending that this is not an outright grift. Right? Like but, and but he, Phil, he isn't said, he really hold successful? On, on. He's always shopping for Dude. a bunch of designer things. He must have loads of money. He even said, okay, he even said in an interview, I forget if it was with Ivan on tech. I don't even remember who the hell he was talking to. Okay. He even specifically cried about how he lost money. Okay. Like he, he got wrecked leveraging Bitcoin. He got super pissed that a lot of people that he knew in the space got rich with shit coins and that he was going to do it himself. Why shouldn't I do it myself? And so, and then what he did was he spun the marketing to make it seem like he is the honest one. And he was able to do this because he grifted people through Bitcoin. Like he used to sit there on streams and all he would do is dismantle every shitcoin that anybody brought up. So you were like, this, this guy's a good Bitcoiner, right? And that's exactly what they do. He's not the only one to do it. This other guy, I totally forget his name, but he had this shitcoin called Brodium or something like that. And... Um, he did the same thing. He was all about Bitcoin. Andy Hoffman. That's it. Andy Hoffman. He was all about I like Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Right? I like Bitcoin. And now six months later, here's my shitcoin. <laughs> they just get grifted, man. And they all and it's always the same thing. I was late to Bitcoin. This, this is the real thing. You know, oh, it's a certificate of deposit. So it's it's not the same. You know, this is something new, right? You're getting it on the ground floor. Certificate of deposit. <laughs> the way I look at it is that 
inflation and the fiat world uh, drive higher time preference behavior and shitcoiners like Richard Hart simply capitalize on that. They, they, they exploit um, this, this high time preference behavior um, rather than, rather than yeah, pushing Bitcoin, which I think is a, is the biggest catalyst for, for increasing your time preference for, for making you, you have lower time preference. Thank fuck for Brexit, um, because uh, we're no longer part of the EU here in the UK, um, and the EU um, just kind of cucked everyone and, yeah, gave them all European digital identity wallets, um, something they're copying from China, um, a giant step in a world premiere amazing the wallet has the highest level of both security and privacy um just sounds incredible um but it's not right it's just another just another trick that politicians are playing on the populace um i saw this walton i saw this uh that tweet when it came out a few days ago and essentially i believe there was also an accompanying video um, that was extolling the the virtues of being able to tie all of these data points together, right? For in in order, right? In order to have better tracking, and of course, of course, it's always to maintain security and privacy, right? And transparency, all at the same time. So this this is some scary stuff. And, and I, you know, I've said this before and, and I understand that people immediately like, you know, I, I sound like an idiot, but I don't really care. But just think about this, like the people that the people that push this type of stuff forward, I can't believe that they, they have such hubris that they can't imagine that one day their own family members could fall out of, of the elite tree and end up and end up a victim to their own laws. Right. Like it, it's just it to me, it, it's it's very hypocritical. It's like, why would you do this to your, you know, to to your fellow man? If you you know what I mean, you wouldn't want this done to you. It's like it's so basic. It's so basic. And yet it's lost. And anybody like that says something like that, like, you know, I just sound like just sound like a kid. Right. I sound like an idiot who believes in naive things. So anyways, I, I just I'm very disappointed, but not surprised. I'll say that disappointed, but not surprised. I do think a lot of the people that push these types of innovations in air quotes forward actually have their head in a, at least they want it to be in the right place. They really think they're doing good, but the incentives are just not aligned. Like you say, if someone has the keys, they can change the system to do evil. Like the people at MIT DCI who were doing project Hamilton and what's now open CBDC at the fed. I think they are, genuine in their utopian vision for like being able to have a cash equivalent on the internet at least the technologists are i just don't see any way in the future that we're going to be able to roll this out and maintain that utopian vision it's just not going to be allowed someone with the keys will want to use their authority over an individual and that's why we have alternatives to me it's kind of linked to people not really understanding the the second or third order effects of what they're doing i was in a spaces i think two nights ago um and some people were saying oh um i, I tell people to go and watch uh what pedro failed to learn um because because that show has a uh, good guests and uh but don't worry i i warn them about the sponsors and i made the point that okay you might warn your friends about the sponsors of this show but what you are actually doing is not considering the network effects you're not considering that actually by driving people to that kind of show you're increasing the numbers of that show which then draws in more people because that show has numbers who don't have the same warning and that person was completely they went oh yeah hmm people don't think of the next thing that happens they don't think of what what could be the un unintended consequences 
of doing something, even if they're trying to do something good, even if you know they they highlight risks, they don't consider the the next step, the the second or third order effects. Yeah, I, I think that I think that that's very well said, and, and you know I, I think that kind of goes back to the uh, you know the, the personal responsibility, right? The personal responsibility aspect of it as well. Um, I, I have seen, and again, it's not to make this segment about um, you know about Pedro, but the reality is is that I, I saw a uh, a part of an interview where um, somebody goes to shill one of these types of yielding services. And in, instead of taking responsibility for the fact that he shilled BlockFi, right, to his to his viewers, among amongst other crap, you know, he sat there and took the stance of, well, I don't want you to say anything because I'm going to get blamed for it. It's like, no, 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 dude, you put this person on your platform. You, you, you are to blame. Like, you didn't do the due diligence. That's what that is. That's exactly what that is. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody makes mistakes. Like, so we're not sitting here saying like, yeah, you know, you made this and now you're forever wrong. No, but own up to it and be like, you know what? I shouldn't have platformed these people. I shouldn't have taken money from this service and and I know better. But instead, it's it's the whole don't, well, wait a second. They're going to blame me. It's like, no. Anyways, I, it's very disappointing. I think we have in society, we have a, a, um, a, com a crisis, a crisis. Uh an epidemic of a lack of personal responsibility um and this is this is emblematic of this um we're not going to do this and pleb underground we will never we will never shill yield products we will never shill custodians and we'll never shill exchanges because it's a we don't want to have misaligned incentives with our viewers we don't want our viewers to get wrecked um slippery slope on wrecked, we talk about other people who get wrecked. We don't want to ever be talking about our viewers getting wrecked. Exactly. Absolutely. And guys, that actually wraps up wrecked. And we are going to move it on over to the Hopium. The Hopium. Fellow, fellow Bitcoiner, Bitcoin Isaiah, good dude, good dude. And I really appreciated this tweet. I think that this is a fantastic Hopium tweet because guess what? As it turns out, as it turns out, shitcoiners in disbelief, look at this. Bitcoin, lo and behold, our security budget is staying intact. And look at that. Bitcoin has officially flippened ETH. I am pretty sure the uh, the, the Ethers did, did not see this flippening coming this way, but it did. And we're not surprised. Anyways, in daily fees for the first time in three years. Wow. Look at that. There you go. Bitcoin not dead. Uh, this is like a very typical shitcoiner narrative. Always to, to worry about things that aren't actually happening but that may happen if the perfect conditions align. And, and this is how they get you to buy. It's one of the ways that they get you to buy into the narrative um, of their shit coin, right? It's like, look, that could happen. But you see, I this coin has this feature. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Anyways. All right. Moving on to the main part of Hopium. Check this out. This is actually a really great tweet from Tour de Mister. I, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read this whole thing because... This is this is very much this is very much the story of Bitcoin. So here we go, guys. Let's go into it. A hundred years ago today, Weimar Germany abolished the paper mark. And and people, if you wanna if you wanna read up on this, it's the you should read the book when money dies. Anyways, marking the end of Germany's hyperinflation. In that same year, Joseph Wilde, a master goldsmith from Nuremberg, started minting his own coins to advocate for a return to gold standard with private gold coins. Wilde's coins were popular among the public and the German government hated this form of private competition. That's right, the government hates competition with its own money, which it used to levy a continuous inflation tax. Gold broker Kunken notes, his coins were a matter of conviction. He didn't make any money off them. On the contrary, coin dealer Carl Frederick Giebert had to provide financial aid to Joseph Wilde time and time again, mostly by buying his gold coins off him whenever he was in financial distress. Sometime in the year 
of 1928, Joseph Wilde must have started to copy old gold coins from the German Empire. Based on this, in 1929, the goldsmith from Nuremberg was convicted of forgery and sentenced to several years in prison, even though his own coins actually had a much higher intrinsic value than all the money given out by the German government. Nonetheless, at the age of 57, he had to go to prison. He would never leave there. Joseph Wilde, who had produced money of more stable value than the German state, passed away on the 31st of March, 1932. Six decades later, in the United States, a man named Bernard von Nothaus became Joseph Wilde's intellectual successor. In 1998, he started issuing notes backed by gold and silver under the name Liberty Dollar. After some years of being seemingly tolerated by the authorities, Von Nothaus's offices were raided by the FBI in late 2007. Look at that timeline. At the beginning of the financial crisis, this was followed by an indictment in 2009 after years of trial procedures on December 2nd, 2014, despite prosecutor demands that he serve as much as 23 years in federal prison, Von Nothaus was sentenced to six months house arrest with three years probation. Early in 2014, Bernard Von Nothaus attended one of the first Miami Bitcoin conferences where he shared his story with the audience. I had the pleasure of meeting him there and asked if I could be in the photo with him. I feel so blessed that Bitcoin exists and is stronger than ever today. A censorship resistant, scarce, independently verifiable money without centralized issuer, which means it cannot be shut down by governments. Bitcoin's general adoption will go a long way in curbing unsustainable government spending as well as in helping working families protect their savings from the currency debasement that ultimately leads to hyperinflationary tragedies such as that of Weimar Germany. And that, to me, was an extremely powerful story, okay? And it's it's a story of persistence, right? Like, you can see how the desire for freedom continue to persist even through all of that adversity. And we may, we may have just gotten it right with Bitcoin because Bitcoin really is something that they truly can't stop. They might be able to stop individuals, right? Certain individuals, but they can't stop us all. And that's absolutely beautiful. Anyways, Dan, uh, what are your thoughts? Did you, did you see this tweet? I, mean, I saw it. I'm glad you read it out because I didn't <laughs> I didn't read it out when I saw it. Uh, it's amazing that we do have this backdrop that's going to have to make the powers that be adapt to money that makes sense, that works for people. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Walton, did you uh, did you happen to see this one? I'm suspicious about this tour guy. I have a theory, right? And I think I've talked about this before. Um, uh, GG's number... Break. Gigi's number, right? I think any anyone that has more followers than Gigi on Twitter gets bought by someone um, and incentives get skewed, right? Like, even if you're Adam back, you know, like you might get bought by Tether or whoever. Or like, I don't know. There's just... I don't know. I don't, I'm don't. i suspicious of this guy. Frito doesn't like him. Frito says, yeah, watch this guy. I don't know. I don't trust him. I mean, look, he... Look, at the end of the day... Corporate Bitcoiner, right? Like if you go take a look at his, you know, his profile, Blockstream Unchained. So corporate Bitcoiner for sure. Um, but does that mean his opinion is captured? Right. And we can take the post as it is too. We don't need yeah. to evaluate his entire character to evaluate. Oh, oh, the oh no, but, but we have to. <laughs> but this, this, it's a difficult on one, trial right? Here. Like you say, oh, go listen to this person. Because they're right about this, but it there's there's trust conferred, right? There there is. You don't trust people to think for themselves. Oh no, I want people <laughs> to think for themselves. Yeah, but they um, don't. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, this is this actually it's interesting because this kind of goes back to the whole hopium dealer thing, right? You, you, you've got people that, that kind of like fall over themselves to to stand up for their hopium dealers. It's like, well, wait a second. Do you know how much net positive? Do you know how much good he's done for Bitcoin? It's like, OK, so that that's totally fine, even though he wrecked a whole bunch of noobs with a shit coin. I don't like you can't really reconcile that. I understand that you can say, hey, this person did some good stuff for Bitcoin and that's totally fine. In the same breath, if the other part of it is true, 
then that is also part of it. It's not just like we erase one part because another part, you know, like, uh, because something slightly, you know, something different was done. It was still, those actions still happened. Those noobs were still wrecked. That person still chose high time preference. So anyways, I, I don't know. I just hate the net positive argument. It, it's, it's just terrible. Damn it. My I think people don't disclose their, 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 their interests and their partnerships, right? Like, like is, is Max Kaiser a tether shareholder? Who knows? Like the, the, the there are these, you know, big figures in in Bitcoin that aren't necessarily so transparent with with their interests, and so you don't know necessarily what incentives they may have. That's true. That's absolutely true. Like, yeah, with any any sort of hopium, I I always ask, what's the incentive with this person saying this thing now? Exactly. Why mm. am I being told this? Who stands to benefit from it? I forget what the other three questions are, <laughs> but I, I know that I, I know that it's like, yeah, that there's a series of questions that we need to be asking ourselves every single time somebody's trying to tell us how wonderful something is. All right, guys, that wraps up the hopium and it also wraps up our episode for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us build the channel. Don't forget to check us out on our audio-only platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. If you want to stream us sats, check us out on Fountain.fm. You can stream us sats through Breeze. And, of course, amazing guest, Dan Gould. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. One last time, where can people find you? Check out biggold.com. Check out payjoin.org to learn more about payjoin. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Walton. This has been a blast. Sweet. Absolutely awesome. And Walton, how are we going to wrap this one up? Fuckshitcoins.com. Please like and subscribe. We will see you next week.